Hello, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so before we open with a keynote, um, we would like to inform you about a few things. But first, I want to know, how do you like the conference so far? Is it awesome? I, I, I don't hear you. Is, is it awesome? I didn't hear you. Is it awesome? Yeah. Woo! <laughs> so we hope you enjoy these days as well. Um, what we did the last night is that we took a look at the feedback wall. We thank you very much for the feedback. And there are a few things that we want to kind of um, inform you about and ask you about. So one of the feedbacks was about five minutes break between the talks, which means uh, for day three, since today we have only workshops. So I just want to see a show of hands of how many of you really want to have a five minute break. We need to move the program a bit, but okay, that's a, that's a significant number. Okay, so, so we will shift the program a bit and we'll inform you tomorrow morning how it's going to look like, okay? Um, the other feedback that we got is that there's no notebooks to write. Um, there were notebooks and there's still, we, we loaded more notebooks, so if you need, please feel free to go to the area where you registered and you can take notebooks to take your notes. Um, another piece of um, feedback, actually the most important one and the most uh, obvious one, was that the food didn't, uh, wasn't enough, so we have increased the order with 50%, so hopefully today we'll have plenty of food. <laughs> also, due to misunderstanding yesterday with the organization, due to the, of the venue, due to misunderstanding we did not get water in the afternoon. Um, but from today and tomorrow, we're going to have water and coffee throughout the whole day. <laughs> there is a bit of feedback for speakers as well, those of you who are interested to go and see it. Um, also, for the speakers who want to share their slides, please send them to the organizer that contacted you originally, and then we can make them public for everyone. And the other announcement I have is that we have... a. Uh, um, pin wall over there, um, which is a list, an empty list right now, of uh, lightning talks. So if you got inspired over yesterday and today until lunch, you can register over there. If you got inspired and you want to do a five minute lightning talk on stage after lunch, after the keynote after lunch, please write your name and your topic and you will have the stage to do so for the whole team, for the whole organization here, for the whole event. Oh, God damn. For the whole conference, okay? It's too early in the morning, yeah? <laughs> coffee, coffee. <laughs> so, and now I'll give the mic to Zori, who has an announcement about the people who are going on a trip tonight. Yes, that will be a short one. Um, okay, so the Sofia tour is uh, taking place tonight. We are organizing it at about 6.30, so that you can uh, get to the center of the city will um, uh, provide instructions on the pin wall later today for you to um, take a photo and um, find the place. Uh, so uh, the Sofia tour will be two hour walking tour and um, it will be covered uh, as part of your conference fee so you don't have to pay anything. Okay? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Hope you will enjoy it. And also, I would like to ask you if you are here tomorrow until uh, the end of the conference, how many of you are still here? Okay, that's a nice group. Okay, so we are considering maybe a small cocktail at the end, but we want to make sure that there are enough people for the cocktail part. Okay, great. Thank you, and with this, let's get started. Um, I also want to ask you to continue giving feedback on the wall. It is really helpful for us, so we can immediately respond and you know, inspect and adapt. So thank you to everyone who's done that. Please continue doing it. And it's been, I've noticed some appreciation cards also going around, and it's, it's, it's an incredible feeling to get one. So I want to thank the people who have given one to me or to others. And now, we will present Olaf Levitz, a close friend of mine who is just um, awesome. <laughs>
And you have the stage. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a mic. And it's working. Wow. And maybe I have some slides soon. Yay! Awesome. There's a camera, so many people. It's interesting. Does the setup feel comfortable to you? Because most of you seem to be looking <laughs> away from me. Okay, I will get used to that. I'll focus on Pablo. Great. Welcome. I want you to do something at the start. If you have something to write, you can write. If you don't have something to write, you can just memorize. Very, very simple. On a scale of 1 to 10, with your gut feeling, just very quickly, rate your level of trust in this context now. On a scale of 1 to 10, and memorize or write down that number. No need to tell anybody, but feel free to do so if you want to. We'll come back to this later. Done? Great. Many of the ideas I'll be talking about are not my ideas, and I believe in stealing. If you spot an idea that you think you know where I stole it from, please tweet the attribution so that I can collect them afterwards and give proper reference. Um, it's also a thing that you can engage in if you find boring what I talk about because you know it already, right? Then you can keep yourself busy, do, busy doing this. If you spot something that you think is a genuine idea of mine that I'm presenting, and you spot that and attribute it to me correctly, you'll get a free hour of coaching afterwards. How does that sound? OK. I want to run an experiment to give you an experience of uh, one important bit of how your brain works. I'm asking you to close your eyes, listen to what I'm saying, and just noticing what's happening inside you while I'm saying this. And I'm going to start now. Yes, 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 we, we, yeah, yes, yes, yes. In your own time, you may open your eyes again. What did you notice? How does that feel? Smiling. Relaxing. Yeah, relaxing, smiling. What else? Happy. Happy. Anything else? Free. Free. Wow, nice. Warm. Warm. Did you notice anything physical in your body? Open your stomach. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of open? OK. Great. Let's do another experiment. You may close your eyes again. And I'll start now. No. 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 Nine. No. 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 In your own time, open your eyes, come back to the room. What did you notice now? Yeah, physical contraction in your stomach. Even saying this, I feel physical contract contraction in my stomach and my breast. What else? Opposite of the yes, yeah. In many, many ways. Anxiety. Anxiety, yeah. 
Conflict. Stress. Stress. Sadness. Sadness. Restriction. Restriction. Great. So, yes and no. So simple words. We use them so often. And what they do is they generate a toward or away response in your brain. There's basically three parts of the brain. There's a very handy model of the brain, which you can use when you want to ex explain or understand how your brain works. Uh, you just put your fist right next to your head, right? So this is how your brain is situated in your head. This is the brain stem coming up from the spine. The thumb is the um, limbic system where most of the mammalian basic brain functions like belonging, uh, making sense of your emotions, your amygdala is part of this, which is regulating fear. And then there's the cortex <coughs> spanning over the whole thing. And the two middle bits of your, or the two end bits of your middle fingers here, they're the prefrontal cortex, which is the bit of our cortex behind the forehead, which is connecting all of these three areas and controlling it. So prefrontal cortex is the area that you um, train when you pay focused attention, when you do any kind of mindfulness exercise, any kind of introspection or listening to other people's stories. One fascinating thing I found out about the brain this year is that the uh, neural pathways that we use to understand ourselves are actually the very same neural pathways that we use to understand others. So we're listening to each other's stories meaningful stories about challenges, about successes, about things that matter, about things that have this physical reaction in our bodies, uh, then we learn to understand ourselves and we form connections that actually build and change our brain. So, towards response, away response. This is one main function of this limbic system. And whenever we deal with a human being, for instance with ourselves, it's very, very beneficial to be aware Am I currently in an away state? Right? Do I have some of these physical reactions that we just associated with no? Or am I a towards state? Am I in a state where I'm open, where I'm curious, where I can actually listen and pay attention and be focused on something positive? Right? All of the things that we associate with the yes in the exercise. And when we deal with people, with people who are not ourselves, pay attention to the very same thing. The way you behave can create a threat response, an away response, make them afraid. And the way you treat them or you approach them can create a toward response. Right? Invitation, welcome, creates a toward response creates a pull, um, a pull situation. Somebody talked yesterday about leadership. It was Boris. And he was talking about uh, how can we orient a group of people towards something. Right? And when I try to orient them with an away thing, like, do this! Right? Where most of you will go like, why would I want to do this? Then the group will disperse, right? If I go over here and say, welcome, this is my idea. Do you want to join me? People can actually be attracted and uh, we can create a coherent direction in a group. But this only works with invitation. This only works with welcome. This only works, works with asking, which gives people the permission to not come, right? And a lot of the things we do with people, we do with our children, we do with people we meet every day, we do at work, we do when we change them, don't work because of this. One of the greatest toward responses that were generated in me in my professional life were when I stumbled upon real options. And Real Options has given me tools and methods and experiments, experiences 
that have led me to explore this toward a way um, system, and I would like to share that with you. Who is familiar with real options? Okay, not everyone yet. It's about choice. It's about being conscious about what we choose. I'll come back to this story later. And real options works like this. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Please repeat with me. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. I will repeat this until you all participate. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Another interesting thing about the brain, learning requires repetition, right? So when we repeat something, reading and speaking, different areas of your brain, focus attention, your prefrontal cortex, and the repetition, in addition with all of the connection in the group, being part of this community, learning this together, this ensures that you have retention in your brain and that you actually learn this stuff. What's interesting about this? Options have value. The worst state you can ever be in is when you don't have any options to choose from. It's valuable to have options. It's valuable to have a choice because that means you can have this illusion of freedom. Right? I can't remember when we had the last election in Germany. It must have been many years ago when I had the impression of really having a choice. Right? You have these elections where you vote for different parties. I assume that's similar in all European countries. And a German comedian in the 20s said elections would be forbidden if they would actually change anything. And I think the way our current system works, it's kind of keeping the status quo going, but it gives us this illusion of options without actually having a choice. So having options has value, and having awareness of your options has value too. So what this mantra has meant to me over the past five years since I learned it from Chris Matz um, and Olaf Martin, who just arrived, it's hiding in the back, um, is raising my awareness and becoming conscious of my freedom. And this is extremely important when we want to change things, because then we can feel in charge. Options expire. It's a complex world, and as we have learned yesterday, everything depends on context, and the context is always changing. Options expire reminds me of that. Right? The things I can and cannot do change over time. And it's not only about things that I can't do anymore, it's also about things that come up as new transformations of the things I could do before. Um, we had this dinner with a stranger thing last night. I'll tell you how that came about when we created this conference in Berlin four years ago. Uh, we didn't have any money. We had a lot of people who wanted to come or who had said they would come. Most of them hadn't paid yet. We wanted to book a restaurant for a big conference party and we called different places in Berlin. Hey, can we have a conference party on that date with 200 people? And they said, yes, please give us money. And they were like asking for a few thousand to confirm the reservation, right? For 200 people booking a large venue. And we said, oh, we don't have that. So we can't do dinner. And then somebody, it was Corinna from Düsseldorf, she came up with this idea of well, we can't reserve one restaurant for 200 people, but maybe we can reserve 10 restaurants for 20 people because that's a normal reservation and that doesn't cost anything. And then we can have flip charts. People can sign up and, oh, they could go for dinner with somebody they don't know yet and that could serve our mission of creating a community and getting to know each other. Yay, so dinner with a stranger. Right? Constraints, options, expiration, changing over time. This is how you use this to create things and to uh, work with the context you're in so that you get to see more of the opportunities you have. 
The most important line is the last, never commit early unless you know why. This is the hard bit. Because understanding what I want is a kind of lifetime challenge. Right? Finding out how much of the things I think I need to do are actually things that I do because I want to fit in, because my mom told me, because it's what you do, because it's, I don't know, German, it's your duty to do this. Uh, there's so many influences that I can choose to understand, discern, and then actually commit to, because I understand why, right? The most significant commitment I've made in my life, I wear this ring for, is a commitment to my wife. Another kind of commitment is committing to give a talk at a conference, right? Actually showing up, being here, although being on stage, being watched at by more than 100 people is not really feeling comfortable for someone like me. I'm getting used to it, but it's uh, still a challenge. Getting up early in the morning with the lovely help of, again, Chris, who made sure I came into the hotel before midnight last night, who also made sure that I actually got here on time <laughs> this morning. Thank you very much. Um, and to do what you said you will do, right? Also having integrity in, in what you say and do. This is all part of this committing, knowing why. It sounds so easy, right? Never commit early unless you know why. Never commit early unless you know why. Do you still remember? Never commit early unless you know why. Never commit early unless you know why. It sounds less, just like a line in a song, but it, when you look into it, what does it mean to commit? What is early? What does no mean? There's so many ways of knowing. And why? Well, we all know that why is a diff difficult, dangerous, potentially even offensive question. I won't go there now. Just invite you to think, and I invite you to again repeat with me. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. I just have an idea. We've talked about brain and how the brain works. Did you know that your brain gets 20% more oxygen when you stand up? Could we try that? <laughs> I have the hypothesis that this increases retention. Options of value, options expire, <laughs> never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options of value, options expire, never commit early unless you know why. Options expire. <laughs> okay. Very good. Thank you very much. So, choices. Apart from the fact that this movie is very, very, very long, very, very nerdy, very philosophical, has lots of battles in it and lots of violence and lots of great computer effects, there are a few scenes that I would like to draw your attention to because I think they're really, really important to what we do. One thing is the role of Morpheus, the welcoming way of offering a choice. Helping Neo understand that there are two things he could do. He can continue pretending that the world is in is as he wants it to be, and just go back into the matrix and keep doing what he does, like many people choose to every day. And this is a choice we very frequently don't give our clients or our managers or our peers when we work with them in a change project just to keep pretending that what I'm doing is okay, right? I don't want to have fun at work. I want to just show up in the morning, keep my soul outside, do my stuff, go, at, go home at five and start living. Many people choose to do that every day and that's okay, that's their choice. And we have no fucking right to tell them to need to be passionate at work, right? We can invite them to, we can show them that's the other option, right? That's a red pill, which is scary, 
We look at reality, we look at how far the rabbit hole goes, we look at what's really there, and I'll be with you, I'll hold your hand. Right? You will not be alone. This is a very loving way to give a very scary option. So the Morpheus role, make that explicit when we work with people. Offering them this choice, okay, what I'm seeing is, you say this, you do this, right? This is non-judgmental, this is non-violent, to just say what you're seeing. And to just give the other person or give the organization the choice of, keep doing this. Right? You've done 10 change projects where you have changed your org chart. You've changed the way you pretend your organization to be. Well done. If that's what you want to do, keep doing it. If you want to do it again, find a consultant who wants to do that with you. That's not my job. I invite you to look at what's really going on in your organization. And if you don't want to do that, that's fine with me. It's your choice. It's not my choice. Right? And if you are not an external consultant, if you work as a scrum master with a team or as an internal manager or just as a passionate person in an organization who wants to change things, invite people. Say what you see. And if you can't change the organization, change the organization. Don't force people into something. That doesn't work. The other per person is Neil. Neil picks the red pill, which for obvious reasons the movie wouldn't have made sense if he picked the other one. Um, the important bit for Neo is not in this scene. The important bit for Neo is at the very, very end of the third movie, where he's fighting Mr. Smith, and he's fighting and he's fighting, and there are a hundred Mr. Smiths, and Mr. Smith beats him into the water. There's this rainy scene, maybe you remember it. And he said, why don't you stop fighting? Is it for humanity? Is it for love? Is it for X, Y, Z? This is all just illusions. Why don't you stop fighting? And he says, because I've made a choice. Making a choice gives you freedom and it gives you responsibility. So you have the perseverance to go through with your choice. So if you want people to go through a change that is potentially scary, that is potentially painful, make sure that they choose to do this. Because if you tell them to, at some point they will go like, yeah, Olaf, you said we should do this. And we were skeptical from the beginning and we told you it wouldn't work, right? So I'm out now. I've seen this very often. There's a third scene in the movie, I'm not sure where it is, but somewhere in the middle, might be in movie two, where somebody bites into a steak. And he says, ignorance is bliss. Right? It's the guy who's this traitor, and he goes back into the matrix. He takes the blue pill. Be respectful with that choice. There's one thing you take away from, from this talk, is be respectful with that choice. Right? If people choose to make up something, sell it as agile, be respectful with their choice. It's their choice. And if they find customers who buy it, good for them. If you want to do something different, go do that. Right? Be respectful with people's choices, even when you do not agree with what they chose and what, how they make their decision. Right? You can always help people with identifying options. It's very, very scary and dangerous to lead them into ways they didn't choose for themselves. The red pill, blue pill choice, is that an obvious one? When you were in Neo's position, would you just like pick one or would you think? Think. Feel. Feel. Both very good approaches, but you would need a bit of time, right? Who would make a just gut feeling quick decision in this situation? Okay, that's like more than 10 people, more than I expected. Okay, who of you would choose the red pill? Well, there's more now. <laughs> okay, cool. 
Thank you. I've never done this poll before, so I haven't made up my mind what to, uh, what to do with the data, but it's definitely interesting. Maybe we can uh, talk about that later. So, <clears throat> something we do is move people from their comfort zone into something new and potentially magical. And this requires a lot of things on the way. It requires to identify steps. It requires to go out into the open, into the unknown. Uh, it requires courage and it requires trust. And the question is, how do we help people do that? How do we help people make a choice like that? Right? The reality in the Matrix movie didn't even look magical from where Neo was. He just knew the current comfort zone is not real. And I want to look at reality. We usually have a little more to promise. Right? Or a little more to invite people to. We say, okay, you could have fun at work. We could release you from oppression. You could choose to work on something you like doing. This is a very positive thing. Might seem unattainable to a lot of people, but I assume that most of the people who are here are here because they know it's possible. Right? So how do we do this move, and how do we invite others to do this move? Coming back to the yes and no thing, we have this tendency of sorting things into polarities and to have this quick gut decision of, this is my side, right? It's very easy with yes and no. You've heard about black and white thinking, right? We do a lot of right and wrong. And then there's more interesting things like Scrum and Kanban. Lean and agile. Safe, less, dead, mum, or... No, that's not a polarity. <laughs> um, the interesting thing is that when we learn to look at complexity, when we learn to look at reality and all of the different facets and understand how different uh, perspectives, different memories, different histories, biographies, lead people to look at realities in different ways. We understand that polarities are sometimes nice because they're very cheap for the brain to process, but they're not very helpful when we want to change things. So one very common polarity I've been falling into a lot of time in my work is uh, what you're doing is wrong and what I'm proposing, the agile way of working, is right. Right? Which doesn't really work very well because it's not respectful. So how do we do, deal with polarities? Do you have more examples for polarities where they keep you back, where they uh, trap you? Like the ones I mentioned. Waterfall and Agile. Yes, Waterfall and Agile. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Estimates and no estimates. Yeah, everything with a no in front is a good indicator for being a yes-no polarity, right? Ale, uh, Ale 2015 and Agile 2015. <laughs> Ale 2015 and Agile 2015, I like that. I was at both conferences. Who else was? Okay, four people. Great, so we're working on integration. So there are some choices that are obvious. Some of those are polarities. And the thing I want to make you aware of is your brain loves these. The difference in energy consumption, the difference in effort in your brain between making an obvious choice, like who would pick the strawberry? Who would pick the apple? Who would need time to think? OK, fewer than both. That was my expectation, thank you. Um, your brain loves this. So whenever you have this quick reaction like, oh, he's right, when you're witnessing a conversation, or uh, when you're listening to a talk and you go like, oh, that's wrong, um, think. 
breathe and pay attention to what's going on in your mind. It might be a polarity that is leading you into like, oh, this is my side, I feel, feel at home here, and I don't want to really question my thinking. So this is how we keep the status quo. It's very important for survival of a species, right? That's why our brain does this. So it's not wrong to do this. It's just not always useful. And it's not useful when you want to change the way we work. One common approach that's kind of step one on improvement when working with polarities is balancing. I read an article half a year ago which was uh, labeled balance is the new sex because there were so many areas where people talk about balance this, balance that, balance that. Um, a very popular example is work-life balance. You've heard about that, right? Okay. It's based on a false assumption. Are you aware of that? Yes, you're dead at work. Right, who of you is dead at work? Chris is, very good. We need to talk about resurrection at some point. Um, it's based on the assumption and on the habit that I mentioned before. When you go into work, you leave your soul outside. You show up as something, right? Blue pill, pretension, right? You're entering a matrix, right? Playing a role, and then you're leaving that role, you're leaving the matrix, and you're back in reality. And if you see work and life as this, then you need to balance. Because those two things don't mix, because you're two different pe people, two different persons, right? You, you deliberately keep these contexts apart, which is okay, right? It is a way to deal with reality. It might not be the best thing if you want to change something in your life or in the organization that you work in. So balancing is a good first step because it is respectful of both sides, but it still treats them as opposites. What we really want to do is integrate the two. We want to be alive at work. Right? That doesn't necessarily mean that we want to work all day, but if we work on something that we love doing, um, something that I've experienced, and I know a lot of people, people who experience the same, then thinking about what you love doing will keep on going wherever you are and whenever you do it. So it will be hard to limit it to eight hours a day. That doesn't necessarily mean that you work all the time or that you need to be stressed, but you need to find a way to integrate. It's not a balancing act anymore where you can say, I'm now doing this binary, and now I'm doing that binary, okay? Integration is a very, very interesting topic I can't fully cover in this talk, but I invite you to look into integration topics, especially regarding the mind and the brain. There's a lot of research recently done, a lot of uh, interesting books. Uh, I can recommend something later uh, on how to integrate, for instance, your personal history, how to integrate yourself with your relationships, how to integrate your mind with your body. Uh, lots of things that you can do to integrate that are good for your health, good for your team, uh, good for your purposeful being. And uh, a lot of you, I suppose, are familiar with integration in software. And very, uh, in the very same uh, way that frequent integration, continuous integration is helpful for software and for its quality. Um, integration is very, very helpful for human beings and teams, right? Being aware of how we do things and deliberately approving them, uh, having an agreement, having a platform, having a kind of protocol how to integrate, that's very, very useful for teams as well, not only for software. Coming back to the yes and no thing, and looking at integration. A yes makes so much more sense within the space of no. The example where I learned this is uh, when no potential customer tells me, Olaf, I can't work with you, you are too expensive, then my prices are too low. 
I don't have a sensible pricing model unless half of my potential clients say, no, you're too expensive. And that's a very similar, a simple, provocative example. But if you, uh, if you offer something and everybody says yes, how interesting is it? If you make a work of art and everybody likes it, is it, is it art? If you make a connection, if you offer like, if you offer a hug, and everybody <laughs> will come and say, yes, I need your hug. How valuable are your hugs, right? So it's, we, we, we need to have awareness of both of these sides. And it's just, uh, I like this picture, and I like this idea that uh, yes and no come together. Right? And we need to be open for both options so that we um, create more value. A polarity that I observe many of us to be stuck in is the polarity between past and future. And most of us are so stuck in this, and this is a society, culture uh, thing. I don't think it's a, it's, a, it's a human thing. I think there are cultures where this is not so much the case. Um, this is a state of mind that is seriously limiting our options. So when we want to have more valuable options, and the valuable options are in the now thing, which is the yellow bit between the curtains, right? You can barely see it. We are stuck in the past because we're mainly angry at it, angry at the stuff that happened, angry at the stuff we did, Right, all of this blame, shame, etc. thing going on. And we are stuck with the future because we're afraid. We're afraid we don't know, so we're trying to limit the options so that uh, we don't need to be as afraid anymore. So the question is, how do we overcome this? How do we create a bigger space in the middle? How do we escape this feeling of being trapped in a situation, in a context? How do we get in charge? Right? You remember the picture with the comfort zone and the magic? How do I find this ladder to move out of my space and make sense of what else is there and what I could do, etc.? We're frequently stuck in this vicious circle of uh, being ashamed about something, being judgmental about something, uh, being afraid of something, and this is a thing that we can do in our minds with ourselves, we can do it in groups, we can do it in whole nations, right? The way uh, the European Union is currently talking, thinking about refugees in Greece is largely moving along these lines. This is not going to produce any positive change in either of those contexts. What we could do instead is take responsibility. When you remember the difference between the matrix and the choice, right? And the thing I told you about Neo at the very end saying, I've made the choice, so I go through with my decision. He has left this matrix of obligation, blame, shame, and denial. He said, I want to do X. And this is how choice, being aware of an option and choosing to do it and to carry through, to commit, changes the dynamic of yourself in the system. i give you an example. I, like many creative, innovative people, I hate anything that's um, repetitive work, like accounting and taxes. And last year, <clears throat> I became independent two years ago. So last year was the first year where I had really had to sit down and do taxes. And I was like, no, I don't want to do taxes. I don't want to do taxes. I was in denial for a while. Then I started blaming myself. Oh, you're such a bad 
consultant, you're such a bad freelancer, you're such a bad, you, you're not good enough to do this, right? You can't even do accounting. And uh, then you have this blame phase with all oh, this shitty country, it's so much easier in America, why do I live in Germany? <laughs> right? In America, people just have a company credit card and everything they book on that credit card is automatically going as company expenses, beautiful. In Germany, I need to write down for every meal which business partner I invited for, to this food for which purpose so that I can justify this as a company expense. So blaming, right? And then at some point you get into this, okay, I have to do it, obligation, still not fun. And then at some point I had this insight. I said like, hmm, I chose to be a freelancer because I want the freedom. And I chose to be a freelancer in Germany because this country actually comes with a lot of comfortable side effects. It also comes with paying taxes. Right? This is part of the package. This is part of the thing that I chose to do. It's not, I have no problem doing it. I can do it. I can even devise a way that it's like fun to do it or playful. I started doing my receipts with my daughter, giving her a little money, which was nice for her, and I had company, tricks like that. And then I said, okay, I just make the choice of doing these taxes. It doesn't make it fun, but it doesn't feel like oh, I have to anymore, right? I can relax, I can have a yes stance to this. And this is how we take responsibility, or we can take responsibility. Another way you can use this model, a tip for retrospectives, um, very, very fun exercise. Put these categories as uh, kind of columns on the wall and let people collect what they currently do and where they would place that. First thing, I, the first time I did this with a team, they put a sticky labeled testing in the denial column. <laughs> and everybody was like, ooh, that's true. <laughs> Maybe we could move that a little bit. Um, another thing you can do is uh, have this as a kind of chart in your team for the different things you want to try or the different things you're currently doing and uh, say, where do we want to be, right? Currently, we do the daily stand-ups because we have to, okay? So they are in the obligation column. Uh, we do the planning meeting. That's mostly blaming, okay? And they could start having conversations. What do we need to change to move the planning from blame to obligation and the stand-up from obligation to responsibility? Give people, that's kind of mirroring thing, right? You let people see what is really going on and then they have a choice what they want to change. That's one of the things, uh, one of the ways you can actually do this in practice. What makes the difference, in my opinion, is intention. And this is also the hardest bit, which is, seems to be the case with at least anything that I choose to explore. Right? You peel the onion, and you peel the onion, and you get to harder and harder and more obscure bits of the problem. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> and... Um, then you notice that the thing you discover last is the most important and also the hardest bit of the thing. Um, knowing what we want, I think I said this before, it's a lifetime challenge. And nothing in our society invites us to generally spend regular time on this, right? It's not a topic in school not something we talk about with our parents. Maybe we have a conversation like, what do, we, what do you want to do when you grow up? Right, to kind of categorize, label, and find this career path. But uh, really thinking about what do I want? And who am I in the first place? Like, identity and intention. Those are really, really difficult things. And many of the other 
things fall into place once you know what you want. I want to reduce the level of oppression on this planet. And I do a lot of things to help do that. Increasing trust is what I'm good at, so this is how I choose to do this at the moment. More specific thing, I have the intention to talk at this conference, so I create a context where I can talk at this conference. Many people I know choose to, or have the intention to, deliver product to their customer, right? So being clear in that intention, making it more specific, and then figuring out what do I need to do to actually make that happen. And given this intention, you can start digging into this circle of increased clarity. Clarity of intent, clarity of reality, what's really going on, like or the red pill isn't a pill, it's an onion as well, right? You peel away the pretension and then you see more and more of what's really going on. And that gives you clarity of choices. So the first two, intent and reality, are the real options bits. Right? Never commit early unless you know why. That's the intention bit. And options have value. Options expire is the reality bit. What are my options? When do they expire? How do they change? How, how can I influence my options? And then we can make conscious choices. So this is a, a positive alternative to the vicious circle of fear, blame, judgment, shame I mentioned before. Find out what you want and find out options to more and more and more do that. And this is in my op opinion and in my experience what Agile is all about. It's about improvement, deliberate improvement. It's not a label, right? I love this community and I do not think we are an agile community. There's no way I can make this label compute in my head. I've also never seen an agile person. I've never seen an agile organization. Agile is a journey, not a destination. Right? When you look at the manifesto, it's had, it has some things that are more important than others. And when you look at the four lines, Line two to four are examples for the first one. Examples for interactions are more important than the tool we use for the interaction. And it's all about people are more important than the things we do to work together. All of the practices we talk about, Scrum, Kanban, Safe, whatever, they're all on the right side of this. Right? They're all tools. Even estimation, even no estimation is a tool. So what this thing asks us is to continue on a journey of questioning with the intent of people over process. The intent of whatever we do, deliver software maybe. Question the way we do things now so that we can do, do them better tomorrow. And it doesn't matter if you are currently a waterfall organization or a scrum organization or a holacracy organization or whatever organization. Being agile means that you are on this path of deliberate improvement. It's not about where you are, it's about how you get where you want to be. Does that make sense? A more specific model of how to get to this, we dare to look at reality, we dare to look at our options, we dare to look at the... Uh, intentions we have and talk about them is this cycle of vulnerability, showing up, daring to be a little more open than we usually are, leading to more authenticity, having authentic connections, allowing for more safety, which then increases the trust and again allows a little more vulnerability. Many of us do this implicitly, unconsciously. One thing that I have heard 
people say at every A conference I've been at, and a lot of other Agile conferences I've been at, is that newcomers are surprised by the level of intimacy, the level of familiarity, the way they are welcomed and probably hugged at least on their second day when they come in. This is because we are a community of people who dare go outside of normal comfort zones, of what's normal in organizations, doing this. I remember a situation in a bank in Germany two years ago where I went in and just as I always do it, I say what I see in an honest way. And this was the first organization where that got this like, Response, they, people seem to literally believe I would blow up in flames. So they looked at me and were like, what's going to happen now? No, he doesn't blow up in flames. Interesting. Oh, probably somebody is coming crashing through the wall and shooting us now. No, that doesn't happen either. And to see people become aware of, okay, this is what we thought is possible in this office until now. Now we've seen Olaf do this. So there's a whole set of options that I can now consider as potentially possible within my context because I've seen Olaf do this and survive. And I'm very, very sure that all of you have made a similar experience. Doing something in a workplace, in your team, in your organization, wherever you are, that was totally normal to you. You didn't even think about it. And other people were like, hmm. Interesting. The boss came, asked something, and he said no. Right? Simple things. It doesn't need to be big. I obviously, I'm, I'm on stage. I give you the big examples. But the small examples are just as important. And this is how we increase this comfort zone. So looking back at this picture with the ladder and the rope, the vulnerability, the trust, and the, the courage, this is a way to do it. You just set an example, kind of creating this ladder, right? Saying, hey, I'm here. Your place is OK, but this place is OK too. And all of this is implicitly welcome now, because I've done this. And one thing that I noticed is when, when I started making this deliberate, because I became aware I could make it consciously, I could be deliberate about it, and I know people who are very deliberate about this all the time. Um, this opens a lot of new options for you to inspire people to do new, th do new things. So this welcoming thing, how does that work? Uh, to, in my understanding, there are two very specific welcoming dimensions welcoming access, so to say. And they are compassion and understanding. My capacity to be okay with things I don't know, things I don't understand, this is what I would label acceptance, is bigger than most people's. And my capacity to be compassionate with things I don't like, like safe, or people forcing other people to do something, or people submissing to oppression, people to do something, to choose to do something that's clearly not good for them, right? To be compassionate about that and to say, okay, this is your choice. I can see how you're hurting yourself every day. Um, and I'm okay with you doing that. I will keep showing you that I think this is not good for you, but I will not force you to do something else. I will always only be inviting. And this creates a space, right? When I'm coaching somebody, they dare to look at things that from their perspective are not okay. They're not acceptable, they're not forgivable, they are whatever, they are bad, they're wrong. And because I can open this space, people can look at this. And people can start having conversations and insights that they couldn't have without this space. When you look at how leaders invite, 
how founders create a space in an organization. It's also the same thing, right? If as a leader, my level of acceptance for things I don't know or understand is very, very low, I want to know exactly what's going on. I want to know exactly how things are done in my company, right? I'm setting a space. If my acceptance is very, very high, and I'm like, hey, this is what we're going to do here. I don't care how you do it. Right? I don't even want to know because it might scare me. And if something fails, hey, we're in this together. Let's figure out a way to fix it. I don't care about five whys, because five whys is just about agreeing on what went wrong, which doesn't help. Agreeing on what we could do next, that's what I'm inviting people to, okay? So um, this to me is a central kind of physical aspect of leadership, coaching, mentoring, providing space for people to grow. And this happened to be the things that open this curtain. So when I'm accepting things I don't know, accepting things I don't understand, I have less fear of an uncertain future. And if I'm compassionate with things I don't like, if I'm forgiving with things that are not coherent with my values, and these are a lot of things I did yesterday, right? So this is not about blaming some, somebody else. Uh, if I'm compassionate, if I'm okay with my past, I can be at peace and I have this vast space in the present where I can discover all these options. This is a quite recent insight I had about real options. It was probably in the manual, which I didn't read. Is options exist only in the present. So when we look at Options expire, that's because the present always moves. When we look at options have value, the value is informed by the past. So the more I understand about the past, the more I understand about who I am, what I want, what I did, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, the more informed I can look at the options I have, the more I will probably also have learned about expiry, Right about when to do things, etc. But op discovery of options is always only possible in the present. So we need to open the space in the here and now, so that we can be more deliberate about what we choose to do. Quickly moving back, acceptance, capacity to deal with things I don't know, slash I don't understand, and compassion, capacity to deal with things I don't like. These are the two dimensions of a space for growth, space for learning, space for coaching, space for organizational development. And when I talk about leadership, I don't mean this is as a position or role, right? This is something anyone can do. Anyone in any organization, in any group of people, uh, you can be the youngest child in a family, and you can increase this space. If you have a patriarchic hierarchy organization, so you're kind of the grandfather, and you're doing this, you, it might have more effect to the system than if the youngest child does it. And that assumption may be wrong, right? So. Don't take the pretended org chart for granted, right? It might be a blue pill thing. Just show up in reality and do something, and then you see what happens. Somebody said yesterday, shake it, and what was the second thing? Watch, right? Right. So shaking is uh, something you do with reality, not with the org chart. This welcoming thing Right? A welcome with acceptance and compassion is the other side of a coin that is labeled trust. Trust is just how welcome I feel in an environment, in a situation, within a context, with my intention. Right? 
So like um, agile, like love, trust is messy. It's contextual, situational. Depends on your intuition, uh, intention, intuition as well. It's different, and it's also ephemeral, right? You can't really grab it, you can't define it. And we can have really, really valuable conversations about it. Um, and we do have six more minutes. I would like you to remember the number that you picked at the beginning, to turn to your peers, two or three people just around you, and have a two-minute conversation around which factors influenced you picking that number. You don't need to share the number. You don't need to explain why you had a three, seven, or 10 level of trust. But which things influence your level of trust? So what makes up trust for you in this context? Two minutes. simple truth to take away about trust, you can always trust every human being to eventually surprise you. <laughs> That's one common bottom line that you can always be sure of. It's probably not only true for human beings. I've seen it work for dogs as well. <laughs> Key thing is, let go of expectations. There's a Buddhist saying that the source of suffering in the world is that we want reality to be something else, right? This is another way to look at the blue pill, red pill thing, right? So the pretending thing and the, this is not fair, this is not whatever, right? Rubbing yourself on the fact, enjoying the friction of wanting things to be different. This is what creates suffering. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is a choice. And you can choose not to suffer by not having expectations. This is hard. Not saying that it's, it's simple, but it's not easy. 
like Scrum. But um, it's um, possible. It's an aspiration. This is my manifesto. It was created last year with Michael Sahota and Christine Neidhardt, a business partner I work with in Germany. Um, we value people, period. And the surprise thing is one of the principles of this manifesto. It's called Wholehearted Manifesto. You'll find it online. One thing I want to very quickly advertise I'm doing with Christina in starting in October is a leadership academy based on the principles that I've talked about today. Basically, making sense of the circle of clarity of reality, intention, and choices, and how we can create spaces and lead people into this circle and help them grow. And if you're interested, talk to me. Coming back to the Sparkling wine, my award response triggering experience with real options. Uh, who of you has made the experience that people don't like change? <coughs> Another truth, people like change, they don't like to be changed. So when you look at this model of change, change has three steps. The first is raising awareness of what's going on then identifying options of what we could do, and then making the choice. As I've covered before, making a choice is something you shouldn't interfere with. Let people make their own choices. But you can help them with raising awareness and identifying options. And they usually don't mind if you do that in a kind, loving, non-judgmental way. Be kind, be respectful, right? Be human. And let them make their choices. And then this sparkling wine model of change will go a long way with you to help you succeed. Uh, there was some bonus material I would have covered if I had not talked so much already, which is basically about this agile thing being just about this and um, being a journey with a purpose, etc. So I skip that. You have a choice. You know a lot more about choices now, I hope. Uh, compared to an hour ago. I invite you to travel together with me to uh, uncover the options between the yes and the no, or the not now. And this is where you need to know why. Right? Where you haven't yet committed between yes and no later. So, make choices. Increasing connections, increasing art, increasing love, and with courage. Let's create a fellowship, community of leaders. Or let's grow this community of leaders. We created it a while ago already. Thank you. Do we have a minute or two for one or two questions? OK. <laughs> I'm here all day and all day tomorrow. We can invite you for open space session to, to have a further discussion. Yeah, so drag me into an open space session. I'm happy to share more. Thank you so much. Enjoy the conference. Three workshops we have. <laughs> ah, no, it's working. Thank you. So, for the three workshops that we have today, I want to ask um, Chris, Bernhard, and Alexi to give a short presentation. Please feel free to use like a minute because it's a <laughs> they're long workshops, and you could come on stage dancing. Oh. dancing. Yes. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Come on, come on, come on. Please start. You want me to start? Okay. Um, I don't want anyone to come to my session 
because then I won't feel that I am committed to deliver it and then I can go to his. <laughs> Anyone who feels that there is anything of use that's kind of more valuable than the stuff he's going to cover, um, what I'm going to do is, you know we've been talking about scaling, scaling Agile. Has anyone heard of Scaling Agile? Yeah, right. Um, we yesterday were talking about communities of solutions, communities of needs. Um, what I'm going to be doing is showing you a community of needs approach to scaling Agile, which is not about the solutions, it's about understanding what the problems are. So the first half is going to be, how do we scale Agile to 200 Scrum teams with 200 product owners? So it's kind of, it's an experience report, but it's delivered in the form of an interactive workshop. Um, after that, it's kind of once we've identified some of the problems, what I'll do is I'll present one of the tools and we'll have a discussion about how do we solve some of those problems. Um, I'm going to start a new hashtag. It's not going to be no estimates. It's going to be no slides. Woo! <laughs> Okay, uh, I was about to say the same thing uh, about if you don't came to my session, I will go to, to his, but there, there will be a, a scarcity problem because the, the number of places are limited. <laughs> no, it's really limited by the, the format. Uh, in Alpha 2, the room behind this, uh, I will be uh, doing an experiment with you. It's the, called the Red Bead Experiment. It's a really an old one. And uh, we will discover some of uh, Deming uh, principles. And uh, I think it, uh, it's uh, very interesting. So w welcome, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope I can live up to <laughs> what these guys think of me. What I'm going to present is a small game that is just a test because I've never done it before with, um, um, in, in this form. Um, and it will be for about 12 people. We're going to um, make a game where we play through all the practices, the team level practices of sociocracy. So you get a first hand experience how this would look like in a team if you do proposal forming, constant decision making and elections. And the game will be very simple, I will uh, propose a challenge to you, a product idea and a product plan, and you will have to come up um, with, a, um, with an idea how to tackle that as a team, designing a work process, um, managing risk, managing quality, um, with a scarcity problem to make things more interesting. Hopefully it's an interesting game. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know. Thank you very much. No, no slides. And uh, now we'll take just a few seconds for the presenters of Pecha Kucha sessions uh, on stage to maybe just give us some, some tiny clue. Olaf talked about uh, work-life balance and work-life integration or how Jürgen Abloyak likes to call it work-life fusion. So I brought Joppo with me and Hi. So we're going to do a, uh, a Pecha Kucha about uh, how we did presentations uh, this year. We did a lot of presentations together in English and we're going to talk about our experience and show you how this is an example of work-life fusion. Well, I'm going to be talking about Scrum Masters and how you, if you're in a development team, can progress your Scrum Master, and how you can actually tell where he or she is along the way of becoming a real Scrum Master. Bonjour tout le monde. I know you, some people hate French people talking French, but I don't care. <laughs> so I will talk about Slum and what I learned looking, looking at Slum. Slum upgrading, slum and slum upgrading. So uh, this was uh, the information about the talks we have today. And uh, I want to remind you about the lightning talks. If you got inspired, want to share something, just write your name. 
If not, we will use that time for open space, so we'll have to move it, but we'll announce that hopefully uh, during a break, or we'll somehow find a way to gather you <laughs> and, and share that with you. Okay, enjoy the day. There is a question. Um, it was supposed to be... <laughs> Um, okay, so basically that's a bit of a, a longer story, but uh, we're using a plugin for WordPress which seems to be too smart or with too many things fixed. So this was a way to go around that. So it was supposed to be with white font on white background, right, Yavor? But for some reason it got visible. Exactly. Awesome. So enjoy the day and uh, we'll see you all here. There's one more question, sorry. Uh, you, you just go to the workshops. The law to feed, yeah. Thank you. Enjoy the day. <laughs>